Excellent. So let's begin. Our speaker is Brian Hopkins. Rank, crank, and mex. It's all yours. Thank you. So this is a talk that I planned to give in the seminar back in April when we made plans before things changed. So some of this is joint work with James Sellers and some of it is joint work with James Sellers and Dennis Stanton. And I'll explain what's what as we go through. Because partitions are not the everyday topic of this seminar, I'm gonna start kind of from a, not the beginning, but a beginning. So a partition is just a positive, of a positive integer in is an unordered collection of positive integers whose sum is in. So there I've given you all the partitions of four and there are five of them. So we'll use the little p to denote the number of partitions. And here we're just saying the number of partitions of four is five. Lots of applications, it's kind of a basic science aspect of mathematics. First seemed to have been studied by Leibniz who did a little bit, um, Euler did a lot. And then Sylvester, sort of the beginning of American mathematics, did a lot, and then Hardy and Ramanujan, and now there are, of course, many of us, many people who do this kind of work. So one of the first things you think about are how many partitions are there? So there are the number for the first few, and it's getting bigger and gets big very quickly. And so you ask, oh, is there a formula for that? And there is. It's not the kind of formula you want to encounter in a dark alley at night. Um, this is a formula done by Hardy and Ramanujan and later refined by Rademacher. It's a tour de force of analytic number theory, but not many people who do partition work really use this to come up with the numbers above very often. So won't talk about that anymore. But instead, we're going to get the number of partitions by looking at polynomials. So this is a little introduction to generating functions. So what I'm doing is expanding these geometric series, one plus x plus, instead of x squared, I'll write that as to x to the one plus one power. So everything in there is going to be when I have all the parts that are just one. Then the second term, I have twos, then threes. And then when you multiply all of that out, you get these coefficients. And these coefficients, if you have a good short-term memory, are those numbers for the number of partitions we are looking at. So for instance, why is it that there are, the term is five x to the fourth? Well, that five comes from five different things when you mark all this out that simplify to x to the fourth. So there's an x to the fourth itself an x cubed times x to the first, that x to the two plus two power, I could have x squared times that x to the one plus one power, or further down in those dot dot dots, there's four ones all added together. So those exponents, before you simplify them, are exactly the partitions of four that we saw. So each one of these, using geometric series formula, condenses so we don't have to have dot dot dots everywhere. The one with the ones is one over one minus x, and one with the twos is one over one minus x squared. And so we have Euler's generating function for the number of partitions. So you just multiply all those together and you'll have the number of partitions of your value times x to that exponent. Now, when people do this with, you know, talk about partitions, we don't write x, we write about Q. Um, maybe the term X series was taken, so we talk about Q series instead. So I'll keep using X for a while, but when I get sort of more into the meat of the paper, things will change to Qs. One other bit of notation, there's a shorthand for this product of one over one minus Q to the K, is K goes from one up to infinity, and it's just this one over Q sub infinity. It's part of a Pockhammer symbol. It's, there are variations on this, but this is the only one we really need to think about for this work. So the way people really do usually find out what the number of partitions of n is, is to use a recurrence formula that Euler worked on. Actually worked on for quite a while. He had an idea of it, but it took often on 10 years of effort to prove it. He was doing other things in the process, so can't fault him for that. <laughs> 
But what happens if you move these one minus q x to the k up to the top and you expand it, what you see are this, this alternating series, some pluses, some minuses, and the, co the exponent there are what are called generalized pentagonal numbers, thus the pentagonal number theorem. And when you read this the right way, this gives you the formula that p of n is p of n minus 1 plus p of n minus 2. So for a brief moment, it looks like Fibonacci numbers, but it doesn't stay there. Minus p of n minus 5, minus p of n minus 7, etc. So you have a nice recurrence, but it's an infinite recurrence. It just keeps going until you hit uh, a negative number. At that point, p of a negative number is 0. So this is always going to be finite, even though it's going down and down. So one classic result, just to get our hands on some things about partitions, a big game in partitions is um, the number of partitions that have this characteristic equal the number of partitions that have some other characteristic. So the first one of these was, look at all the partitions where the parts are distinct, where there's no overlap, no repetition. So here are all those partitions up through partitions of eight. And you can also ask for partitions where all the parts are odd. They can be repeated, but they just need to be odd. And so you stare at this and you say, oh, there's an equal number of each kind. So there are six partitions of eight into distinct parts, six partitions of eight into odd parts. So is that a coincidence? Of course not. So this is the classic proof and sort of a motivation for why generating functions are so helpful. So if I want to look at just the odd parts, it's like we did before, except I'll just have ones and threes and fives. And then if I'm doing distinct parts, well, I just need to truncate each one of these things. So the way we think about this, if I'm doing the generating function for distinct parts, I either have a one or I don't have a one. I can't have two ones. Either I don't have a two or I do have a two, don't have a three or I have one three, et cetera. So by cutting off each one of those factors after x to the k, whatever that is, this is gonna give us the number of distinct parts. And so here's the proof of why those two kinds of partitions are equinumerous. So we've started with the odd parts. So when we do the geometric series simplification, it looks like this. Then we do an innocent bit of algebra. I'll multiply the top and the bottom by 1 minus x to the 2k. Maybe we're losing what you're counting now, but certainly it's an innocent algebraic operation. So I'm going to re-index now because what's happening on the bottom is that I actually have 1 minus x to each exponent. Here are the odds, here are the evens, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's just 1 minus x to the l for all l's. And on top, I just have 1 minus x to the 2L. I'm just getting the evens on the top. Well, now we're going to actually use something from high school algebra. 1 minus x to the 2L, that's a difference of squares. So that's 1 minus x times 1 plus x. And I can cancel the 1 minus x terms. So I'm left with the product of 1 plus x to the L. And that was our generating function for the number of distinct part partitions. So it started with odd part partitions. Did slightest bit of algebra and ended up with the number, the generating function for the number of distinct part partitions. So early result of Euler. And so now another thing you might think about is when well, we have these numbers, what can we say about them in terms of are, there, are they even, are they odd? Can we always, it looks so, I've started teaching in my university's big um, data science program. So we're going to take, for a few slides, a data science approach to partitions. So I've looked at what the partition, first 4,000 partition numbers are. So here they are divided into even and odd. And it looks pretty even, pretty matched, right? So we don't know. There's not a result that says, as n goes to infinity, these are equal. We certainly suspect that they are roughly equal, but that hasn't been proven. And then you can ask the same question for other terms. So here is odd and even. And then I can say, well, how, what if we look at multiples of three, one more than multiple of three, two more than multiple of three? And those are pretty even. 
I can look at the remainders mod four. These four box heights are about the same. Something weird is happening with five. So there seem to be a lot more multiples of five than there are things with remainder one, two, three, or four mod five. Keep that in mind, but let's keep going. I can look at remainders mod six. Those look pretty even. Remainders mod seven. This looks strange, right? There are a bunch of things that are multiples of seven and fewer that are one, two, three, four, five, or six mod seven. Mod eight looks pretty even. Mod nine looks pretty even. Um, the drawing capacity has sort of fails after that, but we can look at the things more specifically. So here again are the partitions, partition numbers modulo five. So amongst these first 4,000, 1,400 of them are multiples of five. And then the other remainders are roughly the same, but much less than that. Same kind of thing happens for seven. 1,100 of them are multiples of seven. You know, slightly less than 500 of each of the rest are multiples of seven, or have a remainder have the, for the different remainders mod seven. And 11 works out the same way. Lots of multiples 11, you know, more than twice as many of any of the other remainders. But then this isn't just something about the primes. It didn't happen for two and three, and it doesn't happen for 13 either. So there seems to be something going on about five, seven, and 11 that we've seen so far. So this is something that Hardy and Ramanujan worked on. And the story is that they asked McMahon, who was good at doing computations, to give them the partition numbers up through 200. And we've talked about how he probably did this. He has that nice recurrence formula from Euler. So he wrote things out. And here's the beginning of his data. And so Ramanujan looks at this and says, oh, let's look at all the powers of five. And look, there's a whole column where everything looks to be a, a multiple of five. What's that about? So it does look like the number of partitions of five n plus four for any n, integer n, is going to be a multiple of zero mod five, multiple of five. And this keeps going. Um, oh, right. So you may think, well, there are other observations from this table, right? Nothing in the first column is a multiple of five, and nothing in the last column is a multiple of five. But within the data set that McMahon provided, there are multiples of five that pop up. So this is really the only column with a consistent kind of result like that. And you can play the game, same game for seven. So it looks like all the numbers that are five mod seven, the number of partitions of those is a multiple of seven. And similarly, these columns, even though they don't have any multiples of seven, eventually do later on, although they can be farther away. And sorry for the small font, but to get this to fit, here are the partition numbers done in rows of length 11. And you see that there is a column there. that are all multiples of 11. OK? So these things are all true. And Ramanujan proved that there, these results all hold and even proved a little bit more. There are some related results on when you combine these things. So if you look at congruences modulo, more power of five times the power of seven times the power of 11, you can get some nice results too. And he proved these things by generating functions. And this was right near the end of his life, unfortunately. And so he made the comment that it appears there are no equally simple properties for any moduli involving primes other than these three, five, seven, and 11. And that's withstood the test of time, although there are results, but they're not simple results. So let me just show you some of that. Atkin in the 60s found something about all the numbers that are 237 modulo 17,303. So this is a mod 13 result, but it's not 13n plus something. It's 17303n plus 237. And then Ken Ono in the year 2000 found that there's something, there's going to be something like this for every prime. 
But again, sort of the starting point can be very large. So the mod 17 result doesn't start until 48 million. So the first one is 1 million something, the next one is 49 million something, and it goes from there. Then even more so, Algren and Ono the next year showed that for any modulus, it doesn't have to be prime, just as long as it doesn't have two or three as a factor, there's gonna be some kind of a n plus b that fits into the, what you plug into the partition count that's going to have some nice modular congruence. And the proofs for these kinds of results are all by another technique called modular forms. But, you know, someone who does enumerative combinatorics and is not very well versed in modular forms, I'd be happier to see some other way of understanding these results. So is there a natural way, say, to put the 30 partitions of nine into five groupings that are all the same size? And this brings us to a very early paper by Freeman Dyson, who's better known for physics and then won the Templeton Prize in religion, but also did a fair bit of mathematics. And unfortunately, he died earlier this year. What we're going to talk about is a 1944 paper uh, in a journal published by the University of Cambridge Math Club called Eureka. And if you remember, this is a 21-year-old Dyson writing an article. And it's, it's very entertaining to read. It's worth finding because he's a bit cheeky in all of it. So I'll let you read this material from the beginning. The title of the article is Some Guesses in the Theory of Partitions. We don't often publish papers just with guesses. So he makes the guess that I'll tell you about for some of these. And then later on, he makes, as he says, even vaguer guesses concerning the existence of identities, which I am not only unable to prove, but also unable to state. So what he did find was he defined a notion called the rank of a partition. There are lots and lots of partition statistics now. This is one of the first ones. The rank is just defined as the first part, the longest part, minus the number of parts. And this is most easily visualized with what's called the Ferrer's diagram. So I've drawn here these sequences of dots. So the way, one way of visualizing the partition 4, 3, 2 is to make a row of four dots, then three dots, and then two dots, and write it flush left. And 441 is over there too. So the rank for these is going to be the first part, in both cases it's four, minus the number of parts, and in both cases that's three. So the rank of both of those partitions of 10, uh, no, of nine that you're looking at, those both have rank one. Okay? So the point of the rank, so here are all the partitions of nine and grouped together by rank, and then the count of them. So one thing to notice is that these counts seem kind of symmetric. Right? There's only one <clears throat> rank eight partition of nine, and you can have negative rank as well, right? If you have a small first part and many parts, the rank could be negative. So there's one partition of nine that has rank negative eight, and that's just the one that has a column of ones, column of dots in the Ferris diagram. So why is it that we have this symmetry? Well, let me move this so I can see all of my slide. No, I can't, but I trust you can. Okay. So you can do a, an operation on these Ferris diagrams that explains this. So one operation on a partition is called conjugation, which turns in the Ferris diagram, it turns rows to columns. It's more complicated to explain in terms of just writing down the parts of a partition, but with this visualization, it's pretty straightforward. So when I swap rows and columns, the number of parts becomes the first part of the conjugate, and then the first part of the original composite, uh, partition becomes the number of parts in the conjugate. So we had this example before, four, three, two, the rank was four minus three. When I look at the conjugate, which works out to be three, three, two, one, you see that the rank is now three minus four, so it's negative one. 
So we can see that the rank of the conjugate is the negative of the rank of the original partition. So that explains the symmetry in this table. Okay. So what I want to do is group those by mod five. So if I put together all the ranks that are eight and three and negative two, all those things are three mod five, there are six of them. I put together the ranks of six and one and negative four. Those are all one mod five, and there are six of those. The ones that are zero mod five, multiples of five, six of them, four mod five, six of those, two mod five, six of those. So the rank, at least for this example of nine, looks to partition the partitions into these five equal groups. And so he conjectured this is going to work for everything, all the numbers of the form 5n plus 4. He conjectured that if you do this rank and do this grouping by modulo 5, you'll always get an equal number of the five possible sets. And the same thing works for the 7n plus 5 partition congruence of Ramanujan. So 10 years later, Atkin and Swinner Swinnerton Dyer prove this. It's a you know involved proof. It's not nice like the Euler generating function thing we looked at before. It's much more involved. Um, use some generating functions, include some of the, including some that Dyson provided and uh, some analysis. But the rank doesn't work for the last Ramanujan recurrence. It doesn't explain why the partitions of 11n plus 6 break into 11 classes. And if you look at the first instant of that, that's the partitions of six. Well, the ranks group up some. We only have nine different rank values that can appear. And so of course, they're not gonna break into 11 classes because there are only nine of them. So the rank is this miraculous thing that explains two of the occurrences, but it's not a full miracle. It has a, its limitations. It doesn't apply to the mod 11 results. But he thought something should. So the paper ends with this. He claims there should be some other statistic, which he calls crank, who knows why, uh, that is that will work for mod 11, but it's going to be more recondite than the rank that he came up with. And then the last paragraph of the paper is this amusing thing where he hopes that the crank doesn't suffer the same fate as the planet Vulcan. And he's not prognosticating about Star Trek 20, 25 years later. Instead, Vulcan was a, an idea on astronomy in the 1800s that there was going to be some little planet we couldn't see inside the orbit of Mercury, making, explain, which would explain some aberrations in the orbit of Mercury that they couldn't explain otherwise. But then, the theory of physics came along, uh, some of the theories came along and explained it. So there's not a Vulcan. So they gave up on, they didn't need it. And so, and of course they never found it. So he's hoping that the crank works out better than that. Another fun thing about the paper is that apparently he was taking classes from Littlewood and he pokes fun at Littlewood throughout the paper. So again, if you can get your hands on it, it's very amusing to read. It took quite a while, but eventually the crank was found. And this is by George Andrews and his, and his just finished being a student, Frank Garvin. And in 1988, they found the elusive crank and it did everything it was needed to. So here's the definition of it. We need to keep track of a few things. We look at the number of ones in a partition and that's gonna be omega. And then mu is gonna be the number of parts that are bigger than omega. In other words, the number of parts greater than the number of ones. So the crank is defined to be, if there are no ones, it's just the first part. And that's the easy part. If there are ones, the crank is going to be mu of lambda minus omega of lambda. In other words, the number of the parts greater than the number of ones minus the number of ones. Indeed, a little bit more recondite than just doing the first part minus the number of parts. 
So a few examples, the crank of four, three, two, that's one of the easy ones, it's just four, because it doesn't have any ones in it. Four, four, one, well, there's one one, and there are two parts greater than that one one, than one, the two fours. So the crank of four, four, one is two minus one, one. So here are all the cranks of six. Remember six is the first instance of 11 in plus six that we need to figure out a nice combinatorial explanation for. So indeed there are 11 different cranks that arise and each one comes up with multiplicity one. So that works for that case. And it also works for 17 and 28 and all the rest that you needed to. What's even better is that the crank doesn't handle just the mod 11 as kind of a standalone thing. It actually deals with all three of Ramanujan's congruences. So here we are back at those 30 partitions of nine. And if I look at their crank, it has a wider range. But if I do the same grouping by mod, nine, mod five, I get a different breakdown of the 30 partitions into five groups of six. So in some sense, you don't need the rank anymore. The crank takes care of all three of them. So the crank is a very important thing. Um, later on, when Karl Malberg wrote a nice paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, uh, George and Ken Ono wrote that this work shows the crank functions are intimately related to all partition congruences. And believe me, there are lots of partition congruences. There are people who, for whom that is their bread and butter, finding different partition congruences. And this work cements the role of the crank in the theory of partitions. So that's what's motivated what we were doing. So we're trying to find different avenues of getting at the crank because you know it's a good definition and we, have, we know a lot about it, but it's not as simple as some other partition statistics. So I forgot I had the slide, yes. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than others. It also has a symmetry. So those tables we looked at, red from the top to the bottom, same as bottom to top, and that's true, and they proved it, but it's not quite as easy to see as it was for the rank. So the work that James and I did connects partitions with a more easily understood statistic that I'll tell you about next. And it's called the MEX of a partition. So the term MEX first was used in combinatorial game theory. And I'll give you a citation later for some places it was used without this name in partitions earlier on. So the max is just going to be the smallest number that's not the smallest positive number that's not in the partition. So here I have all the partitions of six and I've written out what their maxes are. So for five, one, the smallest missing number is two. For six, the smallest missing number is one. Uh, four, one, one is two. So make sure you see that for the partition three, two, one, Smallest missing number is four. So the max could be smaller than the parts in the partition. It can be in the middle of the parts of the partition. It can be bigger than the parts in the partition. So it can be kind of all over, but it's pretty easy to find. It's just the smallest missing thing. So here I've grouped them by the max values. So the earliest citation I've found for this in the context of partitions was a 2006 Ramanujan journal paper by Grobner and Knopfmacher. They called it the least gap. George Andrews talked about this in 2011, calling it the smallest number that is not a sum end. And then um, with David Newman in 2019 in the Annals of Combinatorics, they started using the term MEX. And so maybe now that it has a pithier term, we'll get more use out of it. And it'll be more widely used. So it's a little hard to motivate how this came around, but you just kind of play with things for a while and then you see them. So we had, we, we've looked at grouping things together. So let's think about what happens if we group the MEX by parity. So in the first row, I have all the odd MEX partitions of six. And then the second row is all the even MEX partition, partitions of six. And then if I look at the cranks of six that we've been talking about, if I look at the non-negative cranks from zero up to six, that six is as high as it goes, 
there are six of those. And then if I look at the complement of that, the negative cranks from negative one down to negative six, there are five of those. I mean, these have to add up to 11 because there are 11 total partitions of six. But what's tempting about this is that, oh, it looks like the odd mix happens to match the count of the non-negative crank. And the even mix looks to match the count of the negative crank. And lo and behold, that's true. So this is the brunt of a note that James and I published in the monthly a few months ago. And the result is the number of partitions with odd mix does in fact equal the number of partitions with non-negative crank. So I'll show you a proof of this. It's not going to be too bad, I promise. So one of the first things that, let's see, this is a little bit out of order. So the, here's the generating function for, I think this is backwards, sorry about that. Anyway, so we're looking at the generating function for the mex, the number of partitions of n that have mex m, and the number of partitions of n that have I'm sorry, that have rank M and number of partitions of N that have crank M. So these look very similar, right? So Dyson had thought that the, so he, Dyson gave the rank formula and he suspected the crank formula should be not completely different. So as you stare at this, you might say, what is the difference at all? And the only difference is this one has a three as part of that exponent and that one doesn't. So they are indeed very, very similar. And the even stranger thing is that, you remember Ramanujan went back to India um, towards the end of his life and that's where he died. And there were these notebooks he worked on that have now become known as the lost notebooks, even though they've been found now and have all kinds of riches. And one of the things in there is that Ramanujan had the crank generating function in there without any sort of interpretation, but this is a formula that he was looking at. So it's just fascinating how all, all this plays out. So to connect this to the odd max partitions, we need to have an expression for them. And this one isn't too bad. So uh, this is in one of the papers from George. This is, O of n is going to be the number of partitions of n with smallest missing part odd. So if the smallest missing part, say the smallest missing part is 2n plus 1, well, that means all the parts from 1 up to 2n have to be in the partition. And so that's what this term on top is. I have at least one, 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 two, one, three, all the way up to at least one part of 2n. And on the bottom, this is a lot like what we saw before, except I'm going to take out one of these factors. So I can have, in addition to those, as many ones as I want, as many twos, as many of anything except two n plus ones. So I'm going to not include the one minus q to the two n plus one term down there. And so that's gonna give me the number of partitions of n with odd mix. So here's how the proof works, just two slides. So we start with looking at all the non-negative crank partitions and we put in the right formula. So I'm just gonna, this is the formula we had before, I'm gonna sum from m equals one up to infinity. Well, that kind of pushes through here and this is just a geometric series, which cancels with that. And now if I re-index starting from n equals one down to L starting at zero, I have this very innocent, function, it's our one over Q infinity, that partition thing we've talked about several times. And the sum L equals zero to infinity, negative one to the L, Q to the L plus one choose two power. Triangle numbers showing up. Well, if I start with the odd mex expression that we had, there it is. So I can write that uh, bottom part as just a Q infinity as long as I put a one minus Q to the two N plus one on top. So they so it would cancel that out at the bottom. And we expand through that and we have this. And then what you see is that this is really just odd and even triangle, 
term triangular numbers. So this is 2n times 2n plus 1 over 2. This is 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 2 over 2. If I combine those, I get that same expression we had before. So that's our proof that the odd mex partitions are going to have equal count as the non-negative crank partitions of n. So one little application of this, um, actually I uh, found out this was a undergraduate honors thesis at Penn State. A student lo was looking at this kind of material and showed that the number of odd mex partitions is always, is greater than or equal to the number of even mex partitions for n greater than two. But now that we have an understanding of what these are in terms of crank, we can do better than that. So E of n, remember, was going to be the negative crank partitions. But by that symmetry I alluded to, that's going to be the strictly positive crank partitions of n. So this difference, I can think of this as telling me about O of n minus E of n. What that difference is in terms of crank is just exactly the crank zero partitions. And once we hit three, there's always going to all, there'd be a crank zero partition. So just think about n minus one comma one. There's one part greater than one. One minus one is zero. So what this tells us is that beyond from three and higher, the difference is always positive. So that gives us this improvement of the Shen result, which was you know, marvelous work, but kind of messy in terms of uh, few series and such. So that's the talk I was more or less planning to give in April. And what I'll do with the rest of the time is tell you about what's happened since then. So we were a little um, anxious about how this all played out. Uh, Andrews and Newman had a follow-on paper that came out earlier this year that included that same result I just told you about non-negative non -negative crank and odd max. For us, fortunately, it was published after our monthly note had been accepted. So we then talked monthly and said, oh, there's this you know, independent result that came out at the same time. Can we add a note and keep the paper there? She said, sure. So what happened also is that one of our referee reports said, oh, that's interesting. Here's another way you could do that proof and maybe it generalizes. And so we said to the editor, a friend of mine, Susan Cauley, and said, oh, um, could you ask that referee if he or she would be willing to be identified and so we could follow up on that? And the referee agreed and Susan consented to lifting the double blind referee veil. And so we found out that the referee was Dennis Stanton. And we've been collaborating with him on some of the ideas about this since then. So with the rest of the time, let me tell you about that. One thing we added in was a formula for the number of partitions of n with mex m based on the partition numbers, in the same way that we had Euler had a formula for the partition based on partition numbers. So again, we're going to be using triangle numbers here. I'll write t sub k for the kth triangular number, just 1 plus 2 up to k. So the way it works out is that the number of partitions of n with max m is p of n minus the n m minus first triangular number minus p of n minus the mth triangular number. So the, we've already talked about some of these ideas. To have max m, the partition has to include the parts from 1 up to m minus 1. If I remove one of each one of those, I'm left looking at a partition of n minus t sub m minus one. But to have max m, I have to also exclude m. So if I included m, I would have p of n minus t sub m. So the number that have m excluded is just that difference. So it's gonna be the ones we talked about before, minus p of n minus t m. And one thing we can get with that formula is a nice expression for the number of crank zero partitions in terms of the partition numbers. So remember this O, minus, o, of, n minus, o of n minus E of n was the formula that came up in the work of Shin that we improved slightly. So now if I think about O of n in terms of what we just said, that's going to be the crank of all these various odd numbers minus the crank of even numbers, and the way I've indexed it, the first one that comes up is two. Remember, you can't have a max of zero. So smallest even max is two. 
Now, if I use that proposition I just showed you about expressing these in terms of the partition numbers, we have this. And then if you group these together, you see you just have P of N pop out by itself. And everything else is going to pair up with the same factor. You see that's N minus T sub 2K plus one. And then this is going to match up with the, this other even factor for the next value of K. So together we have P of N plus twice the sum of, from K equals one to infinity, negative one to the K times the number of partitions of N minus T sub K. So one of the other things we came up with was generalizing what the MEX is. So we de de defined something called the J MEX. So that's gonna be, well, first of all, we have to have J being a part of the partition. And then the J max is going to be the least integer greater than J that is not a part. So I have some, some examples of the two max down there. So the two max of two, two, two is three. Certainly the next thing missing from this bigger than two is three. Three, one, one, one doesn't have a two max because two is not a part. So it just does not exist. The two max of three, two, one didn't change anything. It's still four. The smallest missing part greater than two is four. And this is a generalization in the sense of that if you pretend that zero is a part of every partition, the zero max is just the max we've talked about before. So the result we have is that, I've started using this kind of pithier notation, the number of partitions of n with crank greater than or equal to some specified non-negative integer j that's going to equal the number of partitions of n whose j max is odd. So I'm not going to show you many proofs from here on out, but there are some other things we've talked about. You may have heard of the Frobenius symbol. This is another way to talk about partitions. So here we have uh, partition five, four, three, three. And to find the Frobenius symbol, I'm going to put dots in the diagonal that gives the parameters of what's called the Durfee square. And then for each one of these diagonal positions, I'm going to kind of look at the hook, if that's a term you know. There are four boxes to the right of it, so I put a four there, and there are three boxes underneath it, so I put a three there. From this one, the arm has length two, the leg has length two, this one has nothing to the right of it, and one underneath. So that's how I get these expressions. And this is something Frobenius came up with in 1901, I believe. So George Andrews had proven in, back in 2011 that the number of Frobenius symbols that don't have a zero on the top equals, using our current language, the number of partitions of n that have odd max. And now with more recent work, we can also say, oops, ah, what happened? We can also say that that is the number of partitions of n that have non-negative crank. So we have two extensions of that. We can say that the number of partitions of n where the crank is greater than or equal to j as opposed to greater than or equal to zero, that's gonna be the number of partitions of n minus j where the Venus symbol has no j in its top row. So clearly the result from 2011 is the j equals zero case of this new one. The other one is a little different. Um, instead of looking at zeros in the top row, we just look at for many symbols that have no zero in either row. So the number of crank zero partitions of n is gonna be the number of partitions of n where the Fabinius symbol has no zero anywhere, minus the partitions of n minus one, where the Fabinius number has no zero. So I know a lot of us spend time looking at the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. So a way of thinking about this result is that uh, this sequence 1887674, that counts for media symbols that have no zeros. So the first difference of that sequence matches the sequence 064410, which is the crank zero, number of crank zero partitions. So that's a new connection between those two sequences. And the last thing I'll mention is the idea of splitting these odd mix partitions. So a number that's odd, of course, could be one mod three 
uh, one mod four or three mod four. So I'm going to look at those two pieces, an O1 of n will count the partitions of n whose max is one mod four, O3 of n will be the three mod four maxes. So of course, together they add up to the odd maxes. And we'll need reference to Q of n, which I'll use for the number of partitions with distinct parts. And so here's the surprising connection. The number O1 of n equals O3 of n if n is odd. And if it's even, O1 of n is O3 of n plus the number of distinct partitions of n over two. Kind of surprising. And the way we can prove that, I'll just talk about this briefly. Uh, you can you know, just kind of start from scratch and do some Q-series work, but we found a nice result by Ewell from 1973 JCTA that has these partition formulas. He and some other people did lots of results where some, some combination of the partition numbers equals zero or equals something nice. So in this first one, if I look at the sum of negative one to the jth triangle number, and then the number of partitions of 2j, 2k minus the jth triangle number, k is just some arbitrary integer, that works out to be the number of distinct part partitions of k. If I do the same thing for 2k plus 1 instead of k, everything cancels out and I get down to 0. And so the way our proof works is just a very rough sketch. I can think of O1 and O3 as these expressions in terms of maxes, which by the proposition I showed you have these expressions in terms of partition numbers. And then I can recast these to kind of match what we want. And you see the Q of K just kind of falls out. So this just falls out very nicely once we have this expression of the maxes in terms of the partition numbers. And this gives a nice proof of something in the first paper that Andrews and Newman did. So they had the result that O of n is almost always even, and it's odd exactly for the ends up being twice the pentagonal numbers that we talked about towards the beginning. And so the proof of this that we can give is just very straightforward. O of n is going to be O1 of n plus O3 of n, but that's just by our result. That's either going to be twice O3 of n, which is always an even, even number, or it's twice O3 of n plus Q of n over 2, if n is even. So the only time it's going to be odd is when Q of n over, when n is even, and Q of n over 2 ends up being an odd number. And that just happens by the pentagonal number theorem for these values of n. So I'll close with just some ideas for further work that you can, that you can do in this area. So if you know about partitions, the, you know there's this nice proof by Franklin in the late 1800s for Euler's pentagonal number theorem, where you kind of move some things around in the Ferris diagram and it's, they match up except for the values that are pentagonal numbers. So there might be some Franklin-style combinatorial proof for the result about O1 of n and O3 of n. And you recall we have all these expressions for the odd max partitions matching Frobenius symbols, but no zeros in the top row, um, non-negative crank partitions. We weren't able to find how the subdivision into O1 and O3, what that looks like amongst those sets. So where are those counts within these other combinatorial objects? And then of course, combinatorial proofs for all of this would be great. There are some combinatorial understandings of the crank. They're a little involved, but they're there. But we don't really have yet a combinatorial interpretation for the max or this J max that we came up with. So if you want to see more about this, the paper that James and Dennis and I have recently finished is up on the archive or just send me email. And I'm glad to hear any questions you have. I appreciate your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I see everyone is still uh, muted, so. Hmm. Yeah, what do you mean by a combinatorial interpretation for MEX and MEX J? So I'd like to have some idea of a Ferris diagram. So, so the MEX is, it's, you know, philosophically, it's, you're, look, you're talking about something that isn't there. So if I want to have combinatorial proofs that involve the MEX, I need to have some way of moving the dots in the Ferris diagram 
around or you know moving things in a Frobenius symbol. And for other partition statistics, there are ways of doing that, including the crank, if it's involved as the crank is. So by combinatorial interpretation, I guess I mean some way of understanding the max or the J-max in terms of the Ferrer's diagram, that thing with all the dots. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I just felt like uh, it, it's defined in what seems like a combinatorial way, like something is missing and you can sort of, you can't just look at the Ferris diagram and tell that a thing is missing. I guess you have to keep track of everything or something. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to say, you know, you have to look for where the rolling jumps or something and keep track of then what the smallest way of putting in a new row would be. Other questions for Brian? If not, um, thank you again. Uh, it was lovely. Um, thanks. And Many thanks. I guess um, same time, same place uh, next Thursday. Who's speaking? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> um if uh, there's a volunteer um let me know we definitely will have a seminar um okay. and i've invited a couple of people um um who have to tell me when they want to speak and if someone wants to speak next week the first one who does will lock it in uh but we definitely will meet next week um we'll see Okay, everybody. Great. Bye. Thanks. Yeah.